Well, it's an honor to be a part of the inaugural Fulfilled Media Conference. I want to thank Alan Morton for inviting me to participate and for his hard work over the years promoting the preterist view of eschatology. I was raised in the home of a Southern Baptist pastor. As a kid growing up in the 1960s and 1970s, I was heavily influenced by the popular rise of dispensationalism, the teachings of Hal Lindsey, the music like I Wish We'd All Been Ready, the 1972 movie A Thief in the Night, and the incessant focus that we were the terminal generation. As a junior high and high school student, I was afraid that I'd never have the opportunity to marry and have children because Jesus was coming back. I married my high school sweetheart after attending Baylor University and her attending East Tennessee State University. I went into ministry working for James Robinson and then with my dad in international missions, traveling and ministering all over the world. As my wife and I began to have children, it became clear that I could not spend as much time overseas each year as I had been. And over the next 40 years, I pastored two churches in the Fort Worth, Dallas Metroplex and continued to make a few international trips each year. My life experience has included ministry, business, and politics. I've been privileged to serve as a governor's appointee under both Governor Rick Perry and Governor Greg Abbott in Texas, as a commissioner of the Texas Ethics Commission, and as a chairman of the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. I also served as a board member and chairman of the JPS Health Network in Fort Worth, Texas, a $1 billion a year entity with over 6,500 employees. In the early 1980s, I began to question dispensational eschatology. It was introduced to the writings of David Chilton, J. Marcellus Kick, Philip Morrow, Gary DeMar, and many others. It launched a 40-year journey plus of questions, pursuing truth, studying the scriptures, studying the teachers of different points of view. I thought I had an understanding of preterism, but really I was clueless until I came across the teachings of Don Preston about 10 years ago. As I read, studied, listened to his videos and tapes, attended his conferences, simply soaked up everything I could get my hands on, my mind was blown. I searched the scriptures and piece by piece, the puzzle began to come together and it made more sense to me than anything I'd ever heard or believed in the past. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on preterism, just a pursuer of truth. I've come to realize that it's possible to be theologically sound and still be wrong, as well as to be theologically incorrect and still be right. Now, what do I mean by that? Clearly, the goal of Scripture is that we are transformed to reflect the nature and character of God in the way we live our lives. We're to be conformed to the image of Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul stated that the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Jesus stated that the true mark of his disciples would be their love for one another. John 13, 35, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. In fact, in his Sermon on the Mount, what I call his kingdom manifesto, he took it a step further, stating that we're to love even our enemies. In Luke chapter 6, verses 35 to 36, he put it this way, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now, it was this verse that had the greatest impact on my life early on in my journey. I was involved in the heated back and forth of political debate and began to see how people used being right on the issues as an excuse for being mean to people who didn't agree. And I'll never forget when this passage came alive to me. If God himself is kind to evil and ungrateful men, what right do I have to be anything less? Rather than condemning, belittling, insulting, berating, and dismissing those who are perceived as enemies, 
We're called to love them and to be kind and merciful toward them. It's really not complicated. We've all heard it expressed as the golden rule. Jesus said in Luke 6, 31, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Now, as preterists, we believe that the kingdom has come, that through faith in Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah of Israel and Savior of the whole world, we have unhindered, unlimited access to the presence of God. We live in fellowship with him. He has made his tabernacle, his dwelling place among men. He lives and dwells among us. Paul stated that, quote, we have as our ambition to be pleasing to him, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. And then knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5, 11. Now, <clears throat> persuasion is not accomplished in anger and unkindness. In Colossians 3, Paul summarizes the contrast between the kingdom way of living and the way of living by those outside the kingdom, which at one time included us. He encourages those who are in Christ with the following exhortation. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other who has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That's Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. Now, as Jesus followers, our mandate for the manner in which we're to live our lives in relationship with others, whether they agree with us or not, whether they are like us or not, and whether or not they even like us, is to live with a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This is what a true Jesus follower looks like. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Paul wrote it this way, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. He stated that, quote, we have died and our life is hidden with Christ in God. We're to literally put on Christ. He said, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10. Now, now Paul was dealing with a chaotic period of time. As the first century Jesus followers were being persecuted by the first century Jews. It it was just as Jesus told his disciples it was going to come about. He, He told them that they would be hated, persecuted, and many of them would even be killed. They'd be betrayed by one another, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. And he said, they will deliver you to the courts and you will be flogged in the synagogues, Mark chapter 13, verse 9. And in the face of all of that, Paul was encouraging the Jesus followers to walk in love, even in the face of hatred and persecution, not to react, not to seek retribution. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. 
And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 16 to 21. So let's go back to our opening verse where Paul stated that the goal of his instruction was love from a pure heart. While instructing in truth and seeking to persuade men to the truth, his goal was love from a pure heart. Now, it's amazing to me that many so-called Jesus followers justify anger, hatred, unkindness, ridicule, belittling, and berating their perceived opponents. How does a Jesus follower resort, resort to such tactics? Jesus stated it this way. They'll make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he's offering service to God. John 16, verse 2. In our desire to be right and proclaim truth, resorting to evil, unkindness, hatred, belittling, and berating is the opposite of the way of the kingdom. We have much to learn from Paul and his way of dealing with his opponents. Yes, he was a passionate proclaimer of truth, but his goal was to persuade men to the truth, and his manner of persuasion was just, import, just as important as the truth he proclaimed. And we see this demonstrated in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 21. He says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, look at this. Not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation, or this same word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now again, our manner of persuasion is just as important as the truth we are seeking to persuade men to embrace. I'll, I'll never forget an incident that occurred in the mid-1980s. Southland Corporation, the parent company of 7-Eleven, had made the decision to sell pornography in its 7-Eleven stores. The decision brought about massive opposition, boycotts, and public pro protests outside of the corporate headquarters in Dallas. And one night a news report came on and had cameras capturing the protesters and the defenders of, quote, free speech, going nose to nose, yelling at each other, red-faced. A few days later, I was in the office of a friend and we were discussing the protests against 7-Eleven and another individual came in and sat down and joined in our discussion. And as we were discussing the hateful behavior of the Christian protesters, it immediately dawned on me that the guy at the center of the news cameras yelling and screaming at the supporters of porn being sold in 7-Eleven was the guy that was sitting right in front of me. He was an evangelist. And the following passage came to mind. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen 
my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. In our, if in our pursuit of persuading men to the truth, we embrace methods that are contrary to the way of Christ, we end up no better than the Pharisees who in persecuting, flogging, and even killing their opponents thought they were rendering service to God. The mark of a true disciple, a true Jesus follower, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. We live and walk in peace, not chaos. We live in love and kindness, not in ridicule and hatefulness. We don't think of ourselves as better than anyone else because of what we know, but we treat all people as we'd want to be treated, especially those who criticize, ridicule, and even persecute us. We don't overcome evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good. We lay down our lives for the sake of others. It, it is in humility, kindness, and love that people are persuaded to truth. And even if they choose to be unpersuaded, it doesn't release us from the mandate to love and walk in kindness toward them. For God himself is kind to evil and ungrateful men. What right? In the pursuit of Christ-likeness, do we have to live in any other way? We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the heavens. God himself has established his dwelling place among us. We're to be the reflectors of his nature and his character within the world around us. We're to walk in love toward all people everywhere in all circumstances. Do we want to react when we're treated wrongly? Sure, but we exercise self-control. We are constrained by Christ. We look to him as our example of how to live out our lives in this world. Yes, we passionately proclaim truth, but we recognize that the manner in which we proclaim it is as important as the truth we seek to proclaim. It's one thing for a person to choose to be unpersuaded. Not all people are going to accept the message of the kingdom. But it's quite another thing if the reason they reject the message is because of the messenger. I think Paul understood this better than anyone. He wrote this in 1 Corinthians 9. For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law is under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men so that I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker in it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, and you could put in there, we do it to receive an imperishable wreath. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified or a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, 
verses 19 to 27. Passionately seek truth. Passionately embrace truth. Passionately proclaim truth. Passionately persuade others toward truth. And passionately reflect the nature and character of him who is truth embodied. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, God bless you and hope you enjoy this conference. And I hope it, it takes you to another level in your pursuit of truth, and in your pursuit of him who is truth. Amen.